Okay, welcome everybody again uh, to the second lecture of uh, Sylvain Ribot that will speak about bootstrapping uh, to the loop models. Please, uh, Sylvain. Thank you, Francesco. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, <laughs> I'll start with a few reminders from the last lectures. Or, um, so, we, we'd like to build uh, conformal field series based on the just conformal symmetry, so the Virasoro times Virasoro bar algebra. So, uh, for that, I mean, we also want this series to be solvable, exactly solvable if possible. So the fields we'll use, uh, well, we start by uh, using degenerate fields. So these fields are parameterized by two integer cats indices, R and S, and we assume they are diagonal, they have the same left and right momentums, while well, momentum is equivalent to conformal dimension. We can also use non-degenerate diagonal fields with an arbitrary uh, momentum. <coughs> and from these two types of fields, we can build the usual uh, minimal models, well, diagonal minimal models, and we can also build Liouville theory, for example. Now, um, we'd also like to have non-diagonal fields, so fields with non-zero spin. Um, well, this has good motivations from applications to, to statistical physics or quantum gravity. And uh, the idea is to parameterize them by cats indices as well. However, now the cats indices means that they really have different left and right dimensions, PRS and PR minus S. So this is just a notation for the moment. We are replacing two variables, the left and right dimensions, with two other variables, the, these cats indices. But as we have seen, this notation is very convenient when we write OPEs with degenerate fields. So let me remind you what these OPEs are. So the OPEs of uh, degenerate fields with diagonal fields to begin with, well, we have two terms, and the, the momentum just gets shifted by beta over 2 for this degenerate field here, or 1 over 2 beta for the other degenerate field V12. Uh, I'm focusing on V12 and V21 because these are the two simplest degenerate fields, and by their OPEs, they generate all the rest. So now, uh, what if we do the same with um, non-diagonal fields? Um, well, so the, as with diagonal fields, oops, the, um, just the consideration of uh, Virasoro symmetry would allow us to have four terms here, because on the, both on the left and on the right you have two choices. But then we added the condition that the spin uh, should be half integer. <laughs> which was motivated by single valueness of correlation functions. And with this condition, we can keep only two terms. So if we do a V2 and VRS, we have these two terms here. VR R gets shifted by, by one, basically. And moreover, we have this condition that S has to be half integer. All this from single valueness. And uh, similarly, for V1, 2, it's S which is shif shifted by one and R, the first index, which has to be half integer. So basically, from single valueness, uh, these indices, R and S, for non-diagonal fields, uh, get quantized. They get quantized because we have a discrete condition on the spin, R times S, which has to be half integer, and also a discrete condition on one of the indices, if we assume that there, there exists some degenerate field here. So, in fact, we will not assume that we have both degenerate fields at the same time. This would be a bit too restrictive, and we would, I mean, the model would basically boil down to a, a non diagonal minimal model if we did that. So, we would have uh, also a um, rational centered charge. Um, so, here we'll, um, we'll assume that we have only one of these degenerate fields. So, b before d doing that, I still have one small uh, constraint on these um, non-diagonal fields and their correlation function, uh, which appears if I'm considering a correlation function with a bunch of non-diagonal fields here, Ri, Si, and one degenerate field. So the, the idea is that now we have uh, the, the monodromy of this degenerate field around VRS. Well, we can compute this monodromy because we know the, there are OPEs of these two fields. We know that what appears is in the OPEs VR plus or minus 1S. And 
If you remember that uh, the OP, okay, so let me write this OP, maybe, V12, Vrs, and what is the coefficient here, the dependence on Z, on Z12, I mean, on the positions of these fields? Well, it is uh, the, the difference of, of dimensions. Well, actually, what I want is also the dependence on Z bar, so, um, so it's delta, um, well, okay, I, I'm not, I, I, the idea is that the monodromy it depends on the um, difference of spins. So you have here uh, e two pi i s r plus, oops, s r plus one minus one s minus s r s. Right? I mean, this field, this field is spinless, the, the degenerate field. So the monodromy here is just e plus or minus 2 pi i r. Um, so that's our result. Monodromy is this. And in this endpoint function on the sphere, the product of all monodromies should be 1. And this means that the sum of r i has to be um, integer. So if you remember, in the presence of this degenerate field, each Ri itself is half integer, but their sum is integer. And okay, th this conclusion is true not only for endpoint function in the presence of this field, but also if this field was not there, it would also be true because, well, what happens if you start from this? And, take a, and absorb this degenerate field into another field by taking an OPE, where well you get just an endpoint function instead of n plus 1. And for this endpoint function, you still have the same condition on the sum of the Rs. Okay, so that's the. Uh, here it's 2 pi i r because. Um, ah. Yeah, uh, no, sorry, you're right. This, the, this is V12, so it's Rs plus or minus 1 here. No, the calculation was indeed completely wrong, but the result is correct. Okay, so now that we know this... Um, these basic rules coming from single valueness and from the existence of uh, degenerate fields, uh, let's build the spectrums of loop models. So this still relies on the assumption that the central charge is generic, which means beta squared is not rational. And let's assume that we have this degenerate field V12. So the principle here is to write us what I call an extended spectrum, which contains all the fields that are allowed by these assumptions. So, which, um, for, for, to, for a start, which uh, degenerate fields can we have? Well, let's say we have all degenerate fields which are generated by this one from fusion. So, VD1S for S integer. Okay, now which uh, non diagonal fields can we have? Well, we just saw that R has to be half integer, and S, well, S has to make sure that the, spec the, the spin is itself half integer, so 1 over 2 Rz. And then what about uh, diagonal fields? Well, we have no constraints so far, so any complex momentum would do. So this is, I would say, the, the, the largest set of fields which, which are consistent, I mean, whose correlation functions we could conceivably compute. It does not mean that they will appear when I do an OP, that all these fields will appear. In, in fact, in these models, I will never have an integral over the momentum of diagonal fields. Okay, and here, well, I want to, uh, to restrict slightly my non-diagonal spectrum instead of one half integer here for r, oops, let me take 
a, half a strictly positive integer. And uh, this restriction is, is yes. No, I, I, before I had R be belonging to uh, being a half integer. Uh, now I'm assuming it's half a strictly positive integer, and I'll, I'll just tell you why. So first we have this uh, reflection relation, Vrs is V minus R minus S. Or if you want, we also have Vp equals V minus P. It's just because the dimension is quadratic in P. So this allows me to take R positive. So the non-trivial thing is really why R can be non-zero. And the thing is, if you have a non-diagonal field with zero index here, well, in fact, this is the same as a diagonal field. So that's the idea. This is the same as the diagonal field 1 half beta minus 1 s. It's the same because it has the same left and right dimensions and the same OPE with our degenerate fields. On the other hand, if you take a field of the type VR0, I mean, this is not at all a diagonal field, although it has zero spin, it has the same dimensions on the left and on the right, but if you do an OPE of this thing with V12, uh, you end up with fields that have, uh, have non-zero spins. So V12, this times this, you, you just get this VR plus or minus one. Okay, but for V0S, it's the same as a diagonal field, so I can just uh, f forget it from this part of the spectrum, and if it appears in the theory, it, let's say it's in this sector. Or, I mean, this equation, if you want, it can be rewritten as Vp equals V0 to beta P. So, any conversely, any diagonal field can be rewritten in terms of my non-diagonal in cats indices here. And this, in fact, will be very useful because it allows us to write formulas that uh, are apparently written for non-diagonal fields, but uh, formulas that will also apply to diagonal fields. Okay, any questions about this? Um, okay, so... Yeah. I'm confused about the last point you made. What, what's, why is VR0 if it seems like you're distinguishing fields by more than quantum numbers. Yes, so the, the idea is that you, fields are also distinguished by their fusion with degenerate fields. If you want, that's the idea that my symmetry algebra, in fact, is not just conformal symmetry, but degenerate fields are part of the symmetry. So. Therefore, to, to say if two fields are identical, they also, have to, they also need to have the same OPEs with degenerate fields. In the same way as they should have the, the same OP with the energy momentum tensor. Yeah. Okay, I need to think of it. I mean, the, it's the idea that you, so to recap the logic, did you start with the most general thing, just parameterized in a funny way? and then you started to impose various conditions, because that was not completely obvious. The, the original starting point, you had diagonal, with the degenerate, the, are the degenerate fields just a special case of diagonal? It doesn't seem that way. No, no, it's not. It's not. So there is some additional assumption beyond quantum numbers. Um, okay, so in, in fact, in principle, the field, um, even if you forget this uh, interchiral symmetry, you, if you just consider Virasoro symmetry, a field is not associated <coughs> to just a conformal dimension. A field, in principle, is associated to a representation of the Virasoro algebra. So the point is that for a given dimension, if that dimension is degenerate of the type delta Rs, there could exist different highest weight representations of the Virasoro algebra. There could exist a Verma module, but also a degenerate representation, which is a quotient of the Verma module. But what happens if I take VP and I specialize P to a value, that, uh, to an RS label? Well, in principle, in general, uh, nothing happens and you don't get a degenerate field. So, in general, the limit, if you want, P goes to PRS of VP, that's just VPRS 
which is not the same as VDRS. Because you're not quotienting out the, you're, you're, you're keeping the, uh, of course, there is a degen this, this is degenerate from the Virasoro algebra sense, right? It will be annihilated. Uh, okay, so I'm using the word degenerate to mean really that null vectors vanish. Yes. So here, by taking this limit, I'm not making null vectors vanish. You're not making the null vectors vanish. Okay. You're keeping the null vectors, okay. Right. Got it. However, it turns out that in Liouville theory in particular, if you do the limit, I in fact, you find that null vectors vanish. But that's really the depends on the structure of, of uh, well, correlation functions. Okay, so uh, what does this spectrum look like? So maybe I'll uh, enumerate the first few uh, non-diagonal fields in this spectrum. So the first case is r equals one half. So you have v one half zero. Oh, in fact, I'm enumerating the fields with integer spin. Um, uh, just because in loop models, well, like the ON model, in fact, the spin is not half integer, it's even integer. So for simplicity, I'm focusing on the integer spin sector. And so what can I have here? I can have plus or minus two. I can have plus or minus four, etc. Then I have a R equals one sector, starting with one zero, one one, one plus or minus two. I have r equals three halves, v three halves zero, v three halves two third, well plus or minus two third, v three half plus or minus four third, v three half plus or minus two, etc. And this goes on, well, like that. So that's our spectrum of. Uh, non-diagonal fields. So now if we focus on a specific uh, model, like the ON model, we'll find a, a spectrum which is a subset of the extended spectrum that I wrote. So in particular, the ON spectrum is the following. So for the degenerate fields, well, you don't have quite all the degenerate fields. You only have them if S is odd. And for the non-diagonal fields, here, well, you have all non-diagonal fields with integer spin. Sorry, where does this come from? So integer spin, I think, comes from uh, the fact you have uh, bosonic models, I mean, already at, at the level of the lattice. So if you had half integer spin, you would have uh, objects that anti-commute, and in fact, you don't have that. And then why uh, odd values of s? Well, because if you allowed uh, even value of s, such that v12 here, if you do this OPE, well, you'll find a field whose spin is one half. So if you want all spins to be integer, and also if you want the whole spectrum to be closed on the fusion, then you have to eliminate half of the, the uh, degenerate fields. OK, so that spectrum was originally uh, derived in 87 using a modular bootstrap, uh, a rather complicated calculation. Uh, but uh, here, I, that was an alternative derivation based on, uh, I would say, maybe uh, more fundamental principles. Well, derivation is maybe an exaggeration, but uh, okay, uh, justification. Uh, Sorry, there is no dependence on n? Oh, uh, right. Uh, that's because uh, this n, the n of the ON model, you mean, this n is in fact uh, in a function of the central charge. So the relation is n equals minus 2 cos pi beta squared. But we'll derive this relation in the next, uh, next time. But OK, yeah, in fact, everything depends a lot of n. If you, if you plot the dimensions, they depend on n. However, uh, if you write everything in terms of Katz indices, now it looks like it's n independent. So that's one of the advantages of using this, these notations. 
Sorry, and what about the diagonal fields? Oh, well, you don't have any. Uh, you don't have any? Only these degenerate fields. Oh. On the other hand, in the POTS model, uh, you have some diagonal fields as well, but, uh, uh, well, I'm not writing them here. Okay, so now, speaking of the central charge, well, let's um, discuss a bit the, the values of the central charge. Um, so, we want our OPEs to converge. And typically, an OPE in this type of model will include infinitely many non-diagonal fields. So, what are the conformal dimensions of these non-diagonal fields? So, here I'm computing the total dimension. Uh, that's the, the thing which controls the convergence of OPEs. So, the total dimension is C minus 1 over 12 plus 1 half R squared beta squared plus S squared beta minus 2. And for OPs to converge, I'm assuming that the real part of this total dimension is bonded from below. And this implies that the real part of beta squared is positive, which means the real part of the central charge is less than 13. If you remember, C equals 13 minus 6 beta squared minus 6 beta minus 2. So we have uh, this, uh, I would say, fundamental constraint on the central charge. I mean, these models, as far as I know, don't make sense for larger values of the central charge. Uh, so this is not a big problem if we want to do statistical physics, because with statistical models, you typically have a few degrees of freedom, and therefore a small central charge. Uh, this is more of a problem if you would do uh, for uh, gravity, like uh, um, three-dimensional quantum gravity uh, in the context of ADS3 CFT2. Uh, because the classical limit would be C goes to plus infinity, and that's completely excluded by this condition. So you, you couldn't use these models. Uh, on the other hand, it seems that maybe there is a hope to do quantum gravity in DS3, well, it was claimed that for DS3 quantum gravity, you need a central charge of the type 13 plus imaginary, which is right at the boundary of this allowed region. But okay, for us, I mean, we are mostly thinking of applications to statistical physics, so this is not much of a constraint. Okay. And maybe before diving into bootstrap techniques, I'll just um, comment on whether you could do similar reasonings using degenerate fields in, in CFT in higher dimensions. So the degenerate fields we, we are using are characterized by having finite OPs. And in higher dimensions, the fields that have finite OPs, I think, are called weight shifting operators. And they belong to finite dimensional representations of the conformal algebra. But in the presence of such operators, basically, you get conformal dimensions, I mean, spectrums of primaries whose dimensions differ by integers, uh, which, um, which happens in generalized free theories, but not really in the easing, 3D easing model, for example. So as far as I know, this type of techniques are not directly applicable, or to at least not applicable to the study of um, well, correlation functions or spectrums of physical models. They, they could be helpful for studying conformal blocks, as far as I know. Okay, so any questions? So, so here I'm, I'm thinking of a recent paper by Godet. Well, who studies the wheeler devitt equation in uh, uh, space-time, uh, which looks like uh, R times the Riemann surface, but the volume of the Riemann surface uh, varies with the time. And, and so, he using, uh, well, he's, he makes an ansatz to solve this wheeler devitt equation, and eventually, well, he finds that on this Riemann surface, you have uh, some CFT with a central charge of that type. So, 
ja. Okay. So, finally, let's move to the bootstrap. So, well, not finally, but that's maybe the center of these uh, lectures. And we'll, we'll start by doing uh, analytic bootstrap, and let's see how far we get with that. And uh, then when we, when we are stuck, we'll have to resort to numerical bootstrap. Uh, but to begin with, let me remind you what I mean by bootstrap. So I mean, I mean considering a four-point function on the sphere, which for simplicity I'll write a v1 of z, v2 of 0, v3 at infinity, v4 at 1. So I'm using global conformal symmetry to fix three po of the four positions. And then if I do an OPE between the first two fields, um, I get uh, the composition into conformal blocks. So a sum over k, uh, sum over primaries. Uh, here we have some structure constants. So an OP structure constant c1 to k, a three-point structure constant ck34, and then some conformal block g delta k delta k bar of z, an S-channel conformal block. Um, okay, so um, I guess you're quite familiar with this type of expressions. So uh, the particularity we have in 2D is that this block has some more structure. I mean, since our symmetry algebra is factorized it between left and right moving virasoral algebras, and also our representations of Verma modules are factorized as well, uh, then the block is factorized. So you have GS delta delta bar, which is of the type F delta S modulus squared, well, of Z. So here, so this I would call a conformal block, and this I would call a Virasoro block. So if you want, a Virasoro block is the sum of a Virasoro descendants. So where this curved L was the basis of creation, Virasoro creation operators. But then the full block is the sum of a right descendants and left descendants. The block should, should, shouldn't be modulus squared. Okay, okay so he, this is my infamous modulus squared notation, which means that the uh, right dimension is allowed to be different from the left dimension. Okay, okay. Right? However, you could still complain that um, I'm assuming the representation indeed factorizes left, right, and this is not completely true in these loop models. You also have some logarithmic representations that don't factorize, but uh, I'm skipping them under the carpet. I mean, this is a technical subtlety, and uh, it, it, at generic central charge, it happens only for a small number of representations. But yeah, in, in these cases, the block really doesn't factorize. Okay, so once we have this decomposition, well, the, the bootstrap means solving crossing symmetry equations, which means uh, just uh, writing this, uh, the same decomposition for the three channels, S, T, and U. Um, now, I'm, let, let me write that slightly differently. So we have our four-point function, and in the S channel, so le let me call that the S channel spectrum, let me write a S channel four point structure constant. So before I just had the C12K, CK34, uh, but I won't presume about factorizing this into uh, three point functions. Now I just write a four point structure constant. And then my block. And then the same in the T channel. Oops, a D, T, K, a G, T, K, and the same in the U channel. So now I'd like to consider these equations as linear equations for the four-point structure constants. So 
I'm assuming we know the spectrum here in the S channel. In all channels, in fact, we know the spectrum. We know the blocks. Uh, well, it's not very explicit, but we can compute them. And the only unknowns are these uh, four-point structure constants. So these are really linear equations that we will have to solve. So, well, uh, the spectrum typically has, is infinite. You have infinitely many primary fields. Uh, so this makes uh, solving equations a bit difficult. And the first thing we'll do is to consider special cases when we have uh, one degenerate field in this four-point function, in which case the sums here become finite. So that's uh, what I would call the analytic bootstrap. So the analytic bootstrap starts with a four-point function of the type VD21 at Z, and then three arbitrary primary fields, V1, V2, V3. So I'm saying that the sums become finite. Well, in fact, the sums in this case, we have a sum of two terms in this uh, conformal block decomposition because the only blocks that can appear are uh, dictated by fusion rules. So the, the left blocks in the S channel, uh, they are just, well, diagrammatically of this type. So here we have our degenerate field. And this one, here the, the momentum which can propagate is P1 plus or minus beta over 2. And it's the same in the T channel. Here we have P3 plus or minus beta over 2. So that's, uh, yes, F t plus or minus. So another way to say that we have only two blocks is saying that these uh, four-point functions obey a, a two-dimensional differential equation called the BPZ equation, a second-order, sorry, equation. And the S and T channel blocks provide two different bases of solutions. So this basis, well, well, maybe for a, a quick recap, why do we have BPZ equations? Well, we have BPZ equations because we have these null vector equations of, no, it's 2, 1. But a four-point function of a descendant is always, can, you can always deduce it from the four-point function of primaries, and then if you assume it vanishes, you get a differential equation. Okay, so now we have these two bases. Fs plus minus, Ft plus minus, and they are related by a change of bases. F plus minus S, oh sorry, not now let me call this epsilon 1 uh, of Z is a sum over, then there's a square F, which is a fusing matrix, F epsilon 1, epsilon 3, Ft epsilon 3. <coughs> and what is it? Is this matrix F epsilon 1 epsilon 3? Well, I mean, these are just hypergeometric functions, in fact, solutions of the hypergeometric equation. And we know everything about the hypergeometric equation. In particular, we know these connection matrices. And we can write F epsilon 1 epsilon 3. So it's a bunch of gamma functions. So I'm writing this formula explicitly because really everything about correlation functions follows from this formula. <laughs> and also it's not that complicated. So product plus minus gamma of one half plus beta epsilon one P one plus minus beta P two minus beta epsilon three P three. OK, so now from, th from this formula, from this Euler's gamma functions here, well, everything will follow, uh, in, uh, in particular the structure constants of Liouville theory and, in, in fact, of loop models as well. So how do we do that? Uh, well, we, we take our four-point function and we now solve crossing symmetry. Um, 
So our four-point function, we can write it in the S channel or in the T channel. But using this relation between S and T channel blocks, we can in fact eliminate conformal blocks from the crossing symmetry equation. So let's do it uh, more explicitly. So we have our G of Z. So let's write it as a sum of two terms with a four-point structure constant, which I call small d now, and then the blocks. X here is uh, any channel, S, T, it could even be U. But I'm focusing on the relation between S channel and T channel. So using the uh, relation between S and T channel blocks, I'm eliminating these blocks, uh, this F, these blocks, and then we are left with, uh, with relations for the D, for the uh, structure constants. For example, you have ds minus over ds plus equals, um, equals, well, just a bunch of elements of the fusing matrix. Oops, f plus plus, um, f bar um, plus minus over f plus plus, f plus minus. So we have the right fusing matrix and the, and the left fusing matrix appearing in this equation. So this is really uh, rewriting the crossing symmetry after eliminating the blocks. Okay, so, um, so far we are just looking at solutions of hypergeometric equations. But now we'll remember that these Ds are supposed to be structure constants in a CFT. Because in the S channel, well, we had this degenerate field, this field, and, well, I'm not even saying if this field, the field number one, it could be diagonal, it could be non-diagonal, but anyway, we'll have two fields propagating in the channel. Let me call them one, plus or minus. And then this uh, D, this structure constant here, D, uh, S, plus or minus, is just the product of a structure constant here, appearing, which I will call small c, c1 plus minus, and then a structure constant here, a three-point structure constant now, c1 plus minus 2, 3. And this small c1 is just the, op the, the structure constant that appears in the OPE, vd21, v1, c1 plus minus, v1 plus minus. Okay, uh, no questions about that? Okay, so then we can use this equation, which is a relation for on the left-hand side structure constant, which we don't know, and on the right-hand side, this F matrix, which we know very well, which is the combination of gamma functions. So let's get rid of this small c. I mean, small c is not so important. It only depends on uh, the field number one. And it obeys some uh, consistency conditions, but also th there is some freedom to choose, to choose it because it's it can be changed by your field renormalization. If you do V1 goes to lambda 1 V1, you're changing this small C1. And so we can fix it to a convenient value using uh, renormalization. And so eventually we we get uh, the equation just for big C, which is what we are really interested in, for the three-point structure constant. And so this equation is the following, C1 minus 2, 3 over C1, 2, 3, uh, 1 plus, equals minus 1 to the 2s2, beta to the uh, 4 beta squared r1, a product, and then we have a big bunch of gamma functions, as, as you would expect. So gamma of uh, one half minus beta p one bar plus or minus beta p one p two plus or minus, oops, beta p three bar over plus product plus or minus gamma one half plus beta p one beta p two beta p three. Okay, so these are what I will call shift equations because here we are shifting field one, the, the field number one. Oops. 
Yes. Okay, so we have this uh, equation for structure constants starting from, I mean, all this was derived from the existence of this field V to 1. Now, if we had V1, 2, what would we get? Well, we would get very similar equations, but basically we have to exchange R and S, and we have to exchange P and P bar. Uh, sorry, no, we have to exchange beta and beta inverse. Um, so let me write it uh, to be safe. So we would get just minus 1 to the 2R2, beta to the minus 4 beta minus 2S1, product gamma of 1 half, minus beta minus 1 P1 bar, plus minus beta minus 1 P2 bar, plus minus beta minus 1 P3 bar. And well, there's also a product, gamma 1 half, minus beta minus 1 P1. Okay. So if you have the, at the same time in the same CFT the two degenerate fields, then you get two independent equations for your three-point uh, structure constants. But if you have only one degenerate field, you get only one of these equations. So, other questions? Yes. Um, yeah, in the spectrum of the ON model, we only have the field if, if V13. Uh, However, this is a subtle difference between saying that the field is in the spectrum and that the field exists. So we can still compute correlation functions of V12 in the ON model. And so we'll still have this equation, in fact. On the other hand, I mean, we could, we could do without it. We could fall back on the field V13 and try to find the equations for V13, and I think you would find the same, in fact, but this would be technically more complicated. Okay, so now, well, we are left with the task of solving these equations. Um, so now this really depends in which model we are. So we'll start with minimal models. So in minimal models, um, what do these equations determine? So in minimal models, what you have on the left-hand side is tells you what happens when basically R1 um, the first cat index of the first field is shifted by two, in fact. Equals something known. So, uh, or to be more uh, concise, R1 goes to R1 plus two is known. But since you have two degenerate fields, you also have S1 goes to S1 plus two as well. So you know what happens to, to correlation functions when you shift any cat's index by two. But according to fusion rules of minimal models, I mean, the, in a fusion product, the indices is always run by increments of two anyway. So basically, with these equations, you can determine all three-point structure constants of minimal models. So all this CR1, S1, R2, S2, R3, S3. I'm not writing them now. I'm, I'll write them in a different notation very soon. OK, so now let's consider Liouville theory. So here, now the spectrum is continuous. Uh, sorry, P is just real. So the spectrum is... And Again, you could complain that you don't have any degenerate field in this spectrum. But again, I will answer that you can just assume they exist and follow the consequences. And if they exist, well, you get these two independent shift equations. 
And as a consequence, you, you know how your structure constants behave when P is shifted by beta over 2, so P1, let's say, or uh, so P1 plus beta over 2. So this is known. So what's known is if you want P goes to P plus beta, or P goes to P plus beta inverse. Oops. So is this enough to find the structure constant? Well, this depends a bit on uh, your values of beta and, your, and also on your analyticity assumptions. So if I'm assuming that beta, uh, is beta squared is real but not, in, not uh, rational, uh, then I have uh, on the real line um, so that's the P line. Well, let me even take beta positive. Beta squared positive. So you have beta there, you have beta minus 1 there, and you know how the three-point function behaves under these two shifts, which are independent algebraically. So basically, this, this uh, has a unique solution. And in fact, the same is true if beta squared is real uh, negative as well. And uh, eventually, we'll get all values of beta squared by analytic continuation in beta. So what are these solutions? Well, the point is we have two different solutions, the, the unique solution for this regime and the unique solution for this regime. And they are not related to one another by analytic continuation. Um, so, but to write these solutions, we need a function which basically... Uh, so we need a function which, when, when we shift p by, uh, by beta or by beta inverse, uh, gives us gamma functions, because this expression is a bunch of gamma functions. So the special function which does that is the Barnes double gamma function. And I, I just need to give you its uh, properties, gamma of x plus beta over gamma beta of x equals square root of 2 pi beta beta x minus 1 half over gamma of beta x, and the same for x plus beta inverse. So using this function, we can build solutions of the shift equations. So let me write it. Um, let me write this solution in the case uh, beta squared positive, which means c less than one. So the, the solution is c p one p two p three equals product gamma beta inverse, by which I mean one over gamma beta of um, beta plus beta inverse over 2 plus minus p1 plus minus p2 plus minus p3. So this is the three-point structure constant for Liouville theory in this regime. But in fact, this is also the three-point structure constant of minimal models. I mean, minimal models obey basically the same equations. If you want to get minimal models, you just have to replace pi by some p parameterized by cat's indices. Well, also you write beta squared as a rational number. And the same formula gives you uh, the three-point structure constant. Well, the only thing you might complain about in minimal models is the normalization. Because usually, um, in minimal models, we normalize uh, the two-point structure constant to be one. So, but to, to get this normalization, you, you just have to do a field renormalization. So you do something like C, P1, P2, P3, goes to la la lambda P1, lambda P2, lambda P3, C. If you choose your lambda, you can make sure that uh, you have uh, C, what you want is C uh, identity J, J equals one. So you, you, you can do that by this renormalization. And, um, well, 
eventually you'll get the usual structure constants of minimal models, and from this formula, you could deduce in principle the, the known result that the, in the easing model, C sigma sigma epsilon equals one half. So that's at beta squared equals three quarters. Yes? I, I think I did not understand why as you said, you can use, uh, the, say, the, the structure constants of Liouville should uh, obey constraints from um, degenerate vectors which are not in the spectrum. Well, that's an axiom, really. Uh, even if these degenerate fields are not in the spectrum, I'm assuming they exist, so I'm assuming they have consistent uh, correlation functions. Well, crossing symmetric correlation functions. So, so there is a consistent CFT which has this extra feature, but um, there might be also CFT with actually UV spectrum with uh, completely different structure constants which don't obey those differential equations. Right, you could relax this assumption and look for other CFTs with the same spectrum as Liouville, and so far nobody has found any, but uh, I mean, who knows? Well, in fact, okay, th there are reasons to suspect they don't exist, by st I mean, you can study the more general uh, crossing symmetry, like without uh, involving degenerate fields, and uh, that suggests you, you won't then find more solutions, but I'm not sure this has really been proved rigorously. Okay. <coughs> so now that was Liouville theory with C less than one. Sorry, I have a question. Yes. You never use the fact that this gamma function have uh, vanishing uh, locus, or did you? Yeah, I, I didn't uh, really indeed uh, use the poles or zeros of these gamma functions. And, but these are very important, and this gives rise to poles, well, in fact, to zeros of this. I mean, this gamma beta here, it just has poles. For uh, x in minus beta n, minus beta minus 1 n, so this function has zeros, and this is indeed very important, but I'm not going into these details, but I mean, this matters, yes. And in fact, this is a big difference between Liouville theory with C less than one and Liouville theory in for other values of the central charge. Because for other values of the central charge, we have a different uh, three-point structure constant, which is called the DOZZ for Dornotto, Zamolchikov, Zamolchikov. And this uh, DOZZ, well, it's written in terms of the same um, double, uh, double gamma function, but uh, with a slightly different formula. So in our notation, this formula is gamma i beta now of i over 2 beta minus beta inverse plus or minus uh, i p2, i p1 plus or minus i p2 plus or minus i p3. And then there's a funny normalization here. Uh, which is a product k equals 1 to 3 of gamma i beta of 2 i p k, uh, gamma i beta of i beta minus beta inverse um, minus 2 i p k. Okay, so DOZZ did not uh, get this formula uh, by this method, they got it from the pass integral basically. And the pass integral gives you a specific normalization here, which you could remove by just a field renormalization. And now, indeed, the poles uh, play an important role because now this gamma in the numerator, now it's not gamma inverse like, for, like before, it's gamma, i beta, so it has poles. And it is due to these poles that if you take a limit when some p becomes degenerate, well, you'll end up with a degenerate a field, because if you take this limit inside an OPE, these poles will conspire such that uh, the OPE becomes finite. On the other hand, in Liouville with C less than 1, you don't have the same property, and you, if you take this limit, you, you never get a degenerate field. Okay, any questions on, on this before we move to loop models? Okay, so what happens now in loop models? Well, by, by assumption, we just have one degenerate field. And so that's a bit too little to get a unique solution of our shift equations. So we have, in particular for degenerate, for degenerate fields, VRS, well, due to this uh, 
so, so here for a non-diagonal field, due to this VD12, we know how structure constants behave under S goes to S plus 2. But we know nothing about the behavior when R gets shifted. And moreover, this S goes to S plus 2, I mean, that's not enough because S, in fact, is fractional. So um, integer shifts don't control even the dependence on S. So we get constraints, uh, but uh, not, not strong enough. Now, it's the same if we have, uh, we also have diagonal fields here in the, in the loop models, but again, we, we know how they behave when P goes to P plus beta inverse, but we don't know anything about P goes to P plus beta. And this equation alone, well, it has uh, many solutions. Basically, you can multiply with any periodic function with period beta inverse. So what do we do? Well, the idea is to look for a solution, nevertheless, of, of these equations, of these shift equations. And, well, if we find then numerical results, we'll divide them by our solution and see what's left. Um, Ho hoping that the dividing by this solution we have simplified a bit the, the result, even if this solution is not itself the full answer and is not unique. So the, the, the idea is to, to look for a solution that's simple enough, and what we propose is what we call a reference three-point structure constant, R1S1, R2S2, R3S3. So now that's for three uh, non-diagonal fields, so let me remind you that R is a half integer here, S is of this type, and we propose to take, uh, sorry, product, um, yeah, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3 equals plus or minus, gamma beta inverse of beta plus beta inverse over 2, plus um, beta over 2, absolute value sum epsilon i r i plus beta inverse over 2 sum epsilon i s i. Okay, so that's if you want uh, an ansatz. Um, so first of all, we can afford to put an absolute value because r is really a discrete variable. So if R was a continuous variable, we would spoil analyticity. It would be very bad to have an absolute value, but now, now let's say it's uh, at least plausible. And so what are the properties of this expression? I mean, why did we choose it? Well, I'm not claiming it's unique, but at least it has the following pr nice properties. So it solves shift equations, the same equations I have written, up to signs. Well, the up to signs is more or less, um, uh, we cannot avoid it uh, if we start putting absolute values, right? I mean, in the shift equations, you didn't see any absolute values. So here we are, we are, sp uh, we are introducing uh, sign factors. But um, this is more or less necessary if you want to have uh, permutation, uh, uh, well, symmetry under permutations of the three fields. And then um, it reduces to the Liouville three-point function if, well, if, uh, if you take the correct um, SI, so if you take RI, SI equals zero, uh, sorry, zero to beta PI. So that's the idea that a diagonal field is, can be written as a special case of a non-diagonal field. And if you do that in this formula, uh, it reduces to the formula we had before, which was just uh, also a product of uh, eight uh, gamma beta functions. Okay, so yeah, that, that's... Uh, here I'm admitting that I'm just parachuting this, uh, this ansatz. Uh, I don't have a really strong derivation of it, 
But if you look for a non that, that obeys this type of properties, um, I'm not sure you'll find something else. So this is, I would say, the first step to getting uh, analytic, um, analytic results for structure constants in loop models. So basically, what we'll do now is we do some numerics. So the numerics gives us some uh, value, maybe, so C numerical for, this, uh, for some structure constant. And then we compute, we divide it by the reference structure constant. So the ratio here now will be essentially invariant under shifts up to signs. And so since it's invariant under shifts, it will hopefully be a bit simpler, and, and the aim will be to, to get an analytic formula for this ratio. Okay, so this is basically everything I want to say about analytic bootstrap, and then we'll move to the numerical part. So, are there questions at this point? Okay, so. Okay, so uh, numerical bootstrap. We are back to our shift equations, uh, sorry, to our crossing symmetry equations. So some, well, for, the, for example, our S-channel decomposition is this thing, Gs delta k delta k delta bar k equals the same in the other channels. So um, linear equations for the four-point structure constants. Um, now, the problem with these equations, if we don't have any degenerate field in our four-point function, th so the problem is that we have infinitely many unknowns, which are all these uh, decays. Well, the first thing we can do is to use our shift equations. So, we know, um, so if we specialize to some uh, structure constant for a non-diagonal field, uh, well, let me write this, whoops, D in some channel, so dx, rs, these are the indices of a non-diagonal field. Well, we know how this behaves on the s goes to s plus 2 by shift equations. Uh, so, for example, we can, we can reduce the spectrum by, by modding out this constraint. So, for uh, for the fields with first index half, one half, I just have one field left. All the others, well, I, I'm assuming here that S, the second index, is between minus 1 and 1, using this, these equations. I'm reducing to this, to this case. So for i equals 1 half, I just have one field left. For i equals 1, I have these two fields left. For three halves, I have three fields, etc. So I'm, I have reduced my spectrum, but it's still infinite. So we are forced then to, uh, to truncate it, to make it finite. Um, um, but before doing that, maybe let me, I mean, let me point out that we can use these shift equations to really rephrase, rewrite these uh, crossing symmetry equations in terms of what we could call interchiral conformal blocks or interchiral blocks, which are objects of the type G tilde Rs equals, well, an infinite sum over integers of some known um, ratios of structure constants, so ds R s plus 2k over drs times um, the Virasoro block f p R s plus 2k, f bar, p r minus s minus 2k. So the idea is to combine, to linearly combine all the blocks which are related by the equation s goes to s plus 2, because the ratio of their structure constants is completely determined by the shift equations for structure constants. So this thing is known. And so this G tilde is called an interchiral block, 
so if you rewrite these equations in terms of interkeral blocks, well, you have uh, fewer unknowns. And maybe to make the point a bit more abstractly, um, if we use the initially we use the TVV the associativity of TVV OPE, and basically that's how we could compute conformal blocks. But if you add the associativity of VD1 to VV, so in a sense you're considering this VD1 to as part of the symmetry, just like T itself generates conformal symmetry. If you do that, what you generate are interkeral blocks. So yeah, we, we, we are making use of this uh, in our numerical calculations. I mean, we, if we didn't, I mean, things would be uh, more complicated, of course, with a larger spectrum. Okay, so now, uh, even, even with this uh, technique, we still have uh, infinite spectrum, so let's truncate it. So let's, if we have a spectrum, let's define the truncation uh, so the cutoff is called lambda now. S lambda is the set of primary fields such that the real part of the total conformal dimension is less than lambda. And I'm claiming that if you truncate the spectrum of um, non-diagonal fields, uh, you get a finite truncated spectrum. So let me write that truncate the set of VRS, it becomes finite. It becomes finite provided I obey my constraint re beta squared positive. Because if you remember this delta plus delta bar in the case of a non-diagonal field was essentially beta squared R squared plus beta minus 2 S squared. And R and S are uh, discrete real integers, uh, discrete real numbers. So basically, our spectrum is now finite. So our crossing symmetry equations now have a finite number of unknowns. Which are some uh, dkx. So to determine these unknowns, uh, well, we still have infinitely many crossing symmetry equations because these crossing symmetry equations are valid for any z in the Riemann sphere. So we'll truncate also this uh, set of equations to a finite set. So there are several ways to do that. Uh, one way is to expand around some point. So Taylor expand the crossing symmetry equations around some point z0. And traditionally, uh, it seems the point which is chosen is z0 equals 1 half. So I think it's 1 half because I mean, we have three singularities in our four-point function, 0, 1, infinity. And if you do s a permutation of 1 and 0, so if you're interested in the relation between S and T channel with singularities at 0 and 1, you consider this permutation. There is exactly one global conformal transformation, AZ plus B over CZ plus D, which does this permutation. So that Z goes to 1 minus Z. And the fixed point of this transformation is z0 equals 1 half. But we are doing a bootstrap with the three channels, st and u, and from this point of view, it's not natural to focus on z0 equals 1 half. Um, if we wanted to expand around the point, we would probably consider a permutation like 0, 1, infinity goes to maybe 1, infinity, 0, so a cyclic permutation. And maybe our z0 could, should be a fixed point of this permutation. Uh, so z0 equals ei pi over 3, which is 1 half plus or minus i square root of 3 over 2. OK, so for, from the point of view of the three channels, I think this would be a more natural point for expanding, although technically I'm not sure it would be <laughs> simpler. OK, but we are not really doing this method. We are doing an even more basic method, which is to choose 
a number of points, randomly, a number of, the, of these, and to just write equations at, this, uh, at these points. Um, so, uh, let's call big Z now a set of Zj, and we just choose sufficiently many points uh, to be able to determine all our unknowns. So, what's happening if we do that? Well, we get uh, what I would call an approximate solution. So, we have dk. Uh, so, these are our structure constants that we want to determine. But then we get a solution which depends on the cutoff lambda and also on the choice of these points as big Z. So, this is, let's say, one approximate solution. And um, the hope is that uh, in the limit when lambda goes to infinity, uh, this dk x converges to a true solution of crossing symmetry. Oh, that's an equal. Uh, so how do we know if it uh, indeed uh, if, if this is true? Um, so we don't want to have to take a very large uh, value of the cutoff. So what we do in practice is rather to look whether our solution depends on z. So this z here, big Z, is just the, our set of points where we evaluate uh, crossing symmetry. And uh, quantitatively, to to evaluate this, we compute what we call the deviation epsilon k x lambda, uh, which is uh, one over one minus the ratio of two approximate solutions um, d k x lambda z one when you vary the set of points. And we want this epsilon to be small. Uh, so how small, in fact, should it be? So um, essentially, if in practice, if we don't, if we are not close to a solution, we typically find epsilon of the order of 10 to the minus 2, something like that. And you can even, you can increase lambda, you can do whatever you want, it will stay no better than about 10 to the minus 2. On the other hand, if uh, you are converging towards a solution, you tend to find a small lambda, and I can write to you how small it is. So typically the log of epsilon k, so a small epsilon, sorry, not a small lambda. So the log of this epsilon, well, how small it is depends, of course, on the field you are considering, on the field k. So if this field, it depends on the structure constant for this field and on even on the conformal block. So typically, the log of this product is something like minus lambda. So this epsilon is small uh, if your field has a large contribution to the four-point function. So if it has a large structure constant or a large conformal block, basically. And it gets smaller as you increase lambda. So that's how you know that you are going to converge towards the solution. OK, so um, now it can happen that you are indeed in a space uh, that your sorry, that your crossing symmetry equations have solutions, but that they have too many solutions. Like you, you are in a space in a, let's say, four dimensional space of solutions. So then to make, to make this converge, you have to focus on one particular solution. And I'll give an example of that to, to end um, my talk for today. So the example would be a four-point function of the type v3 half two-third, v1 zero, v1 zero, v1 half zero. So you can write crossing symmetry equations for this type of four-point functions. And if you do that, so you take S channel spectrum to be the same as U channel, in fact. So that's the set of, so we are doing this in the ON model. But we still have to respect the conservation of R modulo integers. So therefore here we have R 
in one half plus n, r is half integral in these channels, um, just because in the s or u channel you have three half plus one, so that's half integer. But in the t channel, you'll get integers v r s. Oops. And then you could wonder if we could have degenerate fields as well, but due to the fusion rules of degenerate fields, they cannot appear in this uh, four-point function. And so if you try to solve crossing symmetry for this four-point function, you won't find a unique solution. To make the solution unique, you have to uh, impose extra constraints. In fact, you have to impose four constraints. So ds one half zero equals one, dt one zero equals dt one one equals du one half zero is zero. So if you impose these four constraints, so you reduce a bit the, spa the, the number of unknowns, and then you find a unique solution in the sense that I just explained, in the sense that when lambda becomes large, your epsilons become small and your uh, solution converges. So other questions on that? Yes, yeah, sorry, I did not understand. What is this, this condition is you found experimentally or? Right, so this condition for the moment is indeed completely uh, experimental. So you, you first try to solve, well, first you have a normalization condition. Of course, your system is linear, so you want to fix something to one. Then you, s you see that your system does not converge. So then you start adding conditions like that. And you had one condition, it still does not converge. Two conditions, it does not, but you find that at the third condition you, you add, it does converge, meaning the deviations become small. But, okay, I mean, zero is a special number. I mean, how did you know you had to set this to zero? Sorry. Well, we are in a vector space, so basically any, any number could do. Oh, okay. But zero is uh, simple, let's say. And in fact, um, this particular solution here we are converging to with these conditions, well, next time uh, I'll try to argue that it, it is very natural and that in fact it corresponds to a specific combinatorial map. So um, the, the precise map is this one. Uh, So this, this map, if you want, corresponds to this four-point function because the valency of each vertex here is twice the first cat's index. So here we have three halves, we have a vertex of valency three. Here we have one, one, one half. So that's the... And now you have several possible combinatorial maps for, with these valencies, but this one, in fact, corresponds to this solution. So that's what I plan to explain uh, next time. Okay, since we are uh, uh, five minutes over time, let's thank uh, Sylvain.